Dams are some of the most complex structures created by humans, not just in their engineering, but in their wide-ranging effects on people and the environment. Being used for electricity production, flood control, and irrigation, they can provide tangible benefits to the world. But dams leave a huge footprint, with some holding back reservoirs larger than Rhode Island, choking the largest rivers in the world upstream of some of the most productive valleys, deltas, and fisheries in the world. The question might arise, is this a good thing? Is it a good thing to refashion nature in such a thorough and expensive way? Despite their reported benefits for water conservation and electricity generation, the hidden costs of dams are great and their benefits have been overstated by reckless engineers and politicians. Dams are an unmitigated ecological and human disaster that steamrolls over the most vulnerable in society and destroys some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. Dams lay waste to the lives that are displaced by their reservoirs, permanently change the nature of the basins they are installed on, and are responsible for the deaths of many as a result of their oftentimes careless design and maintenance. Dams, as a whole, constitute a moral crime against the world in the present and for the future of their existence. This is The Moral Hazards of Dams. First, we'll discuss the philosophical principles that will help us understand and interact with dams from a moral perspective as compared to the engineering perspective that we normally use to engage with them. Dams are a type of hyperobject, but what does that mean? Well, hyperobject is a term coined by environmental philosopher Timothy Morton to describe things whose impact is so large that it transcends the ability to be fixed to a space and time. There are five criteria for hyperobjects. The first is that they are viscous, in that they adhere to any object they touch, no matter how hard the object tries to resist. This class is a perfect example of how dams are viscous, because the more you learn about them, the more you realize how intertwined with them you are. Between all the dams on the Columbia and the dams on its tributaries, it's clear that we are thoroughly, as Washingtonians, enmeshed in the concept of dams. I will demonstrate some points later that will show just how deep this dam issue goes. Hyperobjects are molten, in that they are so massive that they refute the idea that space-time is fixed, concrete, and consistent. Dams are molten because they travel through centuries to exert their force. Many of the dams still standing in the United States were built outside of living memory, whereas in Europe, some of the oldest dams are Roman structures dating to the time of Christ. Dams, like Hoover Dam, are so sturdy that they are expected to outlast human civilization, so they are very much an event that is spread out through time. Hyperobjects are non-local in that they are massively distributed in time and space to the extent that their totality cannot be realized in any particular local manifestation. Dams may be unmoving, but their effects are certainly non-local. When dams in Washington state simultaneously made the landscape they were placed in, reduced salmon harvests in Canada and Alaska, and also helped create the two atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan, it is clear that the effects of dams are non-local. Hyperobjects are phased and they occupy a higher dimensional space than other entities can normally perceive. Dams are phased because their effects exist throughout space and a size of space that cannot be easily perceived, but also because they exist through more time than can be perceived. Dams are now multinational issues. The Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is just the newest and probably not the last dam to be put on a multinational basin. Ethiopia's infrastructure project quickly turned into an international governance crisis as Egypt and Sudan realized that filling the reservoir would eat into their supply of water from the Nile. What was going to be just a hydro dam in East Africa has snowballed into an international conflict involving the US and the UN, a very large footprint indeed. Hyperobjects are finally interobjective, which means they are formed by relations between more than one object. Consequently, entities are only able to perceive the imprint or footprint of a hyperobject upon other objects. Dams, of course, are interobjective because they interact with so many people and problems. Think only of how many people are utterly dependent on just the Colorado River dams, but also how those dams are intersect with farming, international food exports, drought, wildfire, and indigenous rights issues. Because of their huge scope and the perceptual challenge of comprehending them in their entirety, hyperobjects are uniquely difficult for human minds to grapple with. Timothy Morton cites things like climate change, plastic waste, and spent nuclear fuel as examples of hyperproblems that tax our ability to manage them. Dams are also of the same scale of difficulty to manage and are uniquely widespread and intersectional in their effects. The next philosophical concept is the non-identity problem. The non-identity problem is a problem of who we assign moral harms to when the actions taken to prevent them produce different people. Stated with an example, say you build a power plant that will take so long to build that no one alive today will see it finished. When it is built, a town will spring up around the plant where many people will end up living. However, it turns out the plant will pollute the air and cause cancer and asthma in the town's residents. It seems then it would be wrong to build the plant. But consider that if you don't build the plant, then there would be 
no town. No one would be born in the town to be poisoned, so have you really made anyone's lives better? The people born in the town were always going to suffer if they were born, so if they had to choose between their non-existence and their suffering, wouldn't they always rather choose to be alive? Non-identity justifications have been used for a long time to build dams. For politicians, the Bureau of Reclamation, and the Army Corps of Engineers, choosing between causing potential harm to people not yet born, or to see them never exist, they always went with a project that would allow more people to live in the arid west. This justification makes sense to a nation-state because they always need to replace their workforce. But the non-identity problem relies on a couple of assumptions. One, that an act that is wrong must affect a person, that existence is always preferable to non-existence, and that an act cannot be wrong if it harms no one. There are counter-arguments to each of these, but the first one we will look at is whether an act can be wrong if it doesn't affect anyone. This is not necessarily true, as both utilitarians and deontologists who don't agree on anything, would conclude that building the plant is wrong in and of itself despite making no one worse off. A utilitarian would argue that by building the plant you have increased the suffering in the world, and that even though nobody would be worse off individually than if they hadn't been born, the world is worse off for having such suffering in it at all. And a deontologist would argue that you have used the town's residents as a means to building the power plant and not treated them with moral autonomy. A similar interpretation of our responsibility to future generations is also at the cutting edge of climate denial. Hacks nowadays will say that the effects of climate change are too far off in the future for anyone to need to be worried about them. This immediately fails both the utilitarian and deontological test, as whether or not the same people will be created, they will still suffer if temperatures are allowed to rise by three or more degrees, and treating their suffering as a necessary consequence of burning fossil fuels today denies them their moral agency. And the third lens we are going to look at dams through is the lens of indigenous rights. It should go without saying that colonization has been a catastrophic event for the indigenous people of the world. Today, after 500 years of slaughter, disease, relocation, and re-education, Native Americans describe the world they live in as post-apocalyptic. Relegated to a permanent underclass in American society, they have never recovered from relocation. Despite all the attempts to provide lands and replace what was lost, it is clear that the reservation system has impoverished Native people to this day. Liberal philosophers believe that autonomy is necessary for human flourishing, and that to exercise autonomy one must have appropriate mental abilities and an adequate range of options and independence. Indigenous philosophers add that culture is also necessary for a good life, and so extend the right to autonomy for cultures within liberal society as well. This is where modern indigenous rights come from, and it goes to show why cultural destruction is so damaging to people, and why the UN developed a definition for cultural genocide, because the elimination of cultural autonomy is also the elimination of individual autonomy. However, it is also the case that administering this autonomy has been hampered by cultural misunderstandings and by iniquities in the legal system. Dale Turner argues that it is not possible to fully guarantee indigenous rights when the arbiters of the laws and treaties are predominantly white judges and the venue for resolving disputes lies in the courts which have their foundation in English common law rather than anything a native person would recognize. He cites the 1969 decision by the Trudeau government to divide tribal lands into individual lands, a decision to promote individual freedom, which completely ignored the fact that the rights of the individual actually spring out of the rights of the tribe. Or perhaps a more relevant example, when Colonel Pick used the insult of one Indian to deny autonomy to the entirety of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara that were to be displaced by the dams along the Missouri River. Both are examples that deny the rights of the tribe and of cultural autonomy because of a Western bias towards framing issues around the individual. Next, we'll look at some of the specific moral crimes of dams, which is actually challenging to know where to start because of dams' hyper-presence and multidimensionality. So we'll start with the problems of their installation. Resettlement is of course an issue in dam construction, as the reservoirs behind dams can be very large indeed and cannot always be placed in remote places but the scale of the issue is way larger than you're probably thinking. Between just 1980 and 1993, 56 million people were displaced by just 5,000 dams worldwide. That is an enormous catastrophe. To put it into scale, that is larger than the population of South Korea or of New York and Texas combined. There are only 6 million refugees from the Civil War in Syria. There are only 26 million refugees in all of Europe. The largest migration in American history after the Dust Bowl comprised only 2.5 million people but dams displace 4.3 million refugees a year. Anything that was solely responsible for the creation of 4.3 million refugees a year would be rightly labeled a catastrophe, yet dams rarely raise a stir. Seeing dams as a hyper-problem helps us understand why this refugee crisis does not feel like one. Like climate change, there is no one point source for this suffering. On average, each of the dams built during the time period studied displaced around 10,000 people. Which is a lot, but doesn't compare to the largest disasters each year like typhoons and wars. 
but like climate change, there are so many of these sources of displacement that it adds up. Over the next century, we are expected to see refugees from sea level rise, forest fires, storms, floods, and places simply getting too hot. But we won't see the whole picture of it all at once because the effects are so distributed across the globe. So it is with dams. Although some places are worse than others, as most of the displacements in the period came from India and China, and there may be more yet to come out of Africa as nations proactively try to secure their access to water as temperatures rise. But why is it such a bad thing to be a damn refugee? Well, for starters, if it were not such a bad thing, then governments wouldn't feel the need to lie about how many refugees they created. However, the World Bank reported that for dams built between 1986 and 1993, the total number of people to be resettled was 47% higher than the estimate made at the time of appraisal. Lying is probably in those governments' best interest to do, because people resettled because of dams almost always end up living worse lives than they had before. Thayer Scudder's 2002 study of resettlement outcomes in the cases of 50 large dams found that the lives of those resettled were improved in only 7% of cases, that outcomes were neutral in 11%, and a whopping 82% of cases saw people end up being worse off than they had been before. What did they find that led to these failures? Lack of government and NGO staff and funding to deal with resettlement, lack of opportunities provided to refugees, lack of settler participation in the process, and overall lack of political will. This led to landlessness, joblessness, feud insecurity, and marginalization in the communities affected, as well as secondary effects like increased rates of suicide and domestic abuse, as well as resettlement programs offering fewer opportunities to women. Yes, that's right, dams are a mental health and gender equality issue too. Forced resettlement is of course nothing new to indigenous peoples, as they often bear the brunt of state violence when infrastructure is deemed to outweigh human lives and cultural autonomy. Dams being an interobjective hyper-problem, like climate change, touch on many seemingly unrelated problems. Climate change, for instance, is among many things a police militarization problem, demonstrated by the violent crackdown initiated on indigenous protests against the Dakota Access Pipeline in 2016 by police and private military itself an example of a long and bloody history of state violence perpetrated against Native Americans. Dams feature this type of violence too, such as in the case of the Gwembe Tonga, an ethnic minority in Zambia who were fired upon by police for protesting their removal to make way for a dam on the Zambezi River. Or Berta Isabel Cacares Flores, an activist protesting a dam in Honduras, who was assassinated, likely at the order of the companies building the dam. The movement of people affected by dams found in their study of dams that companies were largely responsible for intimidating and criminalizing the opposition, and in many cases even for allowing assassinations to happen. In almost one-fifth of cases, protesters were violently targeted, and in almost one-tenth, at least one activist was assassinated. Rates were higher in indigenous territories. The United States is nearly the most damned country in the world, and has some of the most irrigated land in the world. What did we get for our enormous food surplus that we reaped from so much surplus water? Some of the worst health outcomes in the world, wealth inequality, massive amounts of animal cruelty, and fisheries on the brink of ruin. With so much irrigation water sloshing around, farmers were able to grow more productively than ever before in history, and that combined with things like corn subsidies led to a glut of high fructose corn syrup and soybean oil in the processed foods that make up such a large portion of the American diet. The prevalence of these foods has led to worse health outcomes across the board from diseases such as obesity, diabetes, and cancer. The glut of grain and corn has also led to factory meat production. Americans are some of the biggest meat eaters in the world because it is so cheap for us because factory animal raising has made it more efficient than ever thanks to government-sponsored low corn, grain, and water prices, a product of the massive water projects across the West. Consuming so much meat has similar deleterious effects as high fructose corn syrup does, with the addition of increasing the risks of animal crossover diseases such as the Spanish flu, swine flu, and various types of avian flu, increasing antibiotic resistance as animals are pumped full of antibiotics to quell the diseases created by packing them so close together, and also the enormous carbon emissions of factory farm cattle, which are the largest agricultural emitters of carbon, not to mention the massive animal cruelty that such practices represent. And now we have exported this wasteful form of irrigated farming which has caused massive carbon emissions from changes to land use. The Bolsonaro government burned or let burned 11,000 square kilometers of Brazilian rainforest in 2019 to make way for farming and ranching. This new agriculture has coincided with a boom in dam building which has choked the Amazon and its tributaries, which of course has also displaced hundreds of thousands of indigenous people. This destruction in Brazil and elsewhere is made morally worse by the fact that it is unnecessary, as floodplain agriculture is more efficient per dollar spent than pump irrigation. And furthermore, dams aren't even necessary for developing new water storage, as they are beaten by increasing efficiency and conservation by a factor of 10,000 in terms of cost to generate 1,000 gallons of water. And as we're seeing with the rapidly dropping Lake Mead levels this year, the needs of the hydroelectric plant are soon going to lead to cuts in water deliveries. 
Dams have also destroyed one of the largest sources of sustainable protein, salmon. 90% of salmon on the Columbia were eliminated with the installation of the dams on the trunk stream and the tributaries, which not only represented a cultural genocide of the native peoples of Washington who had been fishing there for 10,000 years, a violation of the autonomy of the tribes along the river, but also a huge missed opportunity for developing a sustainable, low-carbon protein, which is now needed more desperately than ever as cattle and poultry production consumes ever more water and emits ever more carbon. And on top of that, the state mandates the replacement of those fish with inferior hatchery fish, which have overwhelmed wild fish yet failed to respond, often only getting a 1% return. This has had the effect of further decimating wild populations to the point where orcas and salmon in Washington are both on the verge of extinction. This was actually a difficult piece to write because it was so hard to know where to stop for including things. For instance, I left out the wealth inequality dams have created between the agribusiness owners and the farmers that work for them. I left out that the need for those workers combined with racist protectionism created the crisis on the border or how dams are also creating immigration problems for fishing workers or how dams worsen gender inequality or cause crony capitalism to flourish or how they release methane as silt backs up behind their walls or how dam building leads to gentrification or how they've made places like the American Southwest dependent on a single point of infrastructure failure. And of course, all of this is not to mention the tens of thousands of people who have died in the outburst breaches. Dams are a destructive, antiquated, and morally repugnant technology which are needed less and less every day as renewables and battery storage falls in cost. Energy sources which don't actively destroy the environment and worsen iniquities in this world. 